Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Corbell webinar series. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Michaela Meyerhofer from BBM Eric, and she will give us a status update on the Code of Conduct for Health Research Initiative. My name is Vera Matzer, and I'm involved in the Corbell project on behalf of Embel EBI the webinar um, today, and I'll also be manning the questions at the end. Speaker, I want to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded. That includes the questions and answer session at the end, and it will be made available on the Corbell YouTube channel and the website, and that will include a link to the slides. Now, we have reserved some, question, some time at the end for questions. What I'd like you to do is um, write your question in the question function of the GoToWebinar panel, and then we'll go through them at the end. We're going to briefly introduce Corbell to you. Corbell is a Horizon 2020 funded project bringing together 13 research infrastructures in the biomedical science. Corbell aims to transform the understanding of biological mechanisms and help translate them into medical care. Now, modern biological and biomedical research um, involves complex projects that often combine a variety of different technologies and they operate at the interface between different disciplines. Corbell aims to help these harmonizing access and services for research that um, involves more than one research infrastructure. So this could be biological and medical technologies, biological samples or data services. Now our presenter today is Michaela Meyerhofer. She is a political scientist and historian by training. She was educated in Vienna, Louvain-la-Neuve, Essex and Paris. In 2010, she earned her PhD from both the École des Hautes Études Science Social and the University of Vienna, which was shortlisted by the Austrian Society for Political Science for Best Thesis in. Prior to her involvement in BBMRI ERIC, she was an investigator in several national and international research projects, focusing on the politics and the life sciences, especially the governance of biobanks. Her academic various positions at a range of institutes. And today she serves as the Chief Policy and Coordination Officer of BBMRI ERIC, and she coordinates the Code of Conduct for Health Research Initiatives. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Michaela. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful possibility in uh, introducing um, the road, I would say, towards a code of conduct for health research and uh, give you a status update where we are with this initiative. Um, what is always good uh, in terms of uh, considering is uh, to recall what a code of conduct actually means. What is its definition? And here, uh, the most comprehensive one I find is that a code of conduct is a set of rules outlining the social norms, responsibilities of and proper practices for an individual party or organization. So in a, a typical daily life situation, uh, in my personal situation, it would mean a code of conduct between me and my husband is uh, that there always has to be enough pancake supply. And uh, that we definitely do not talk with one another too much in the morning before the second cup of coffee because we are not uh, morning people. In our field, uh, it is, uh, of course, something more serious and uh, um, typically within an organization. So a university has set up a code of, a code of conduct of the do's and don'ts. Uh, among partners, typically in our field, uh, in a research consortium. Um, here I take uh, the project uh, RD Connect as an example, who, had, uh, set up, who has set up a wonderful uh, code of practice. The same is also true for the um, IMI uh, code of practice on transnational research. Um, and thirdly, uh, cross-sector which could be health research, and this is where uh, our initiative is kind of positioned in. Now, the big difference uh, between one and two is, of course, that if it is within one organization, it is limited to this organization only. 
if it is among partners, uh, especially within a research consortium, is it, it is not only limited uh, uh, typically among the partners, but also for the duration of a research project. So the time aspect comes to it as well. And uh, the sector specific uh, is, of course, more complex to set up, but also um, more uh, sustainable and uh, hopefully comprehensive and useful for our field. When we speak of uh, Code of Conduct for Health Research, um, we uh, aim for uh, the GDPR Article 40. And uh, here, the GDPR in Article 40 specifies for Code of Conduct, the member states, the supervisory authorities, typically the data protection uh, authorities on the national level, the board, uh, that would be the European Data Protection Board, and the Commission shall encourage the drawing up of codes of conduct intended to contribute to the proper application of this regulation, talking, taking into account for the specific features of the various processing sectors and the specific needs of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, the processing sector for us uh, is definitely health research, which can encompass uh, clinical trials, uh, uh, research projects uh, from, uh, led by uh, patient organizations, uh, as well as research infrastructures, um, biobanks uh, to the classical uh, research project. Second, Associations and other bodies representing categories of controllers or processes may prepare such code of conduct or amend and extend such codes for the purpose of specifying the application uh, of these regulations. Uh, of this regulation, and that is particularly interesting um, as um, associations or other bodies. Uh, like research infrastructures, uh, for instance, if they have uh, a legal entity uh, or team up with others, uh, could go in this direction. Now, uh, it mentions such as with regard to what are the specifics here. The GDPR specifies it should con uh, consider fair and transparent processing. The legitimate interests pursued by controllers in specific contexts, the collection of personal data, the pseudonymization of personal data, the information provided to the public and to the data subjects, the exercise of the rights of the data subjects, the information provided to and the protection of children, and the manner in which the consent of the holders of parental responsibility over children is to be obtained, the measures and procedures referred to in the Articles 24 and 25, and the measures uh, to ensure security of processing. The notification of personal data breaches to the sup supervisory authorities and the communication of such personal data breaches to data subjects. The transfer of personal data to third countries or international organizations or uh, out-of-court proceedings and other dispute resolution procedures for resolving disputes between controllers and data subject with regards to the processing. Now, uh, not all of these um, items need to be addressed, but a lot of these items can be addressed in uh, a code of conduct. And uh, clearly, in our field health research, uh, there are several aspects that are interesting for us. Therefore, um, BBMRI thought uh, it could be interesting for us also because we have uh, the legal status uh, as ERIC, European Research Infrastructure Consortium, um, to set up uh, and, and really uh, try to uh, draft such a code of conduct. And from the start, uh, we figured out, uh, with the help from our LCS uh, um, experts from our member countries, that whatever we are doing, it does definitely not make sense to do it uh, alone. And uh, immediately we thought uh, of uh, teaming up with our partners uh, in Corbell, um, as well as uh, patient organizations and uh, representatives uh, from the industry. Um, as any comprehensive code that helps us uh, going on the road in simplifying uh, the complex environment we are operating in would be a good idea. 
what are the aims uh, of uh, our Code of Conduct for Health Research to contribute to the proper application of the GDPR, especially taking into account the specific features of processing personal data in the area of health and health research, to clarify and specify certain rules of the GDPR, uh, here in particular for controllers who process personal data for the purposes of scientific research, again in the area of health, to help demonstrate compliance by con the controllers and the uh, processes with the regulation and ultimately uh, to foster transparency and trust in the use of personal data. Put differently, the GDPR um, is a complex law. The national uh, implementation in a lot of countries is uh, still ongoing. Uh, just recently, it was in the news that only uh, seven countries actually managed to be within uh, the timeline um, and have it properly implemented by the 25th of May. Um, other countries uh, will be able to do it by the end of the month. And again, other countries uh, clearly said, well, we are delayed. We might be able to do it uh, by the end of the year. Naturally, the uh, Commission is not very happy about it because there was uh, two years time um, for the implementation, which is quite exceptional. However, as the general data protection regulation, uh, the word general already says it is a big and uh, uh, not easily uh, readable and implementable um, document that also ties into with the country derogations um, of some sensibilities in various member states in taking different roles uh, together. And uh, in the area of uh, health research, clearly the GDPR uh, was not made for health research. It only uh, considers with certain exceptions uh, the area of research as well. Focusing again uh, on the last um, bullet point here to foster transparency and trust. How can uh, this be an aim of a code of conduct? Well, uh, the general data protection regulation and anything I think that we are doing in our field uh, has to be done in the best possible manner with a good uh, balance between data subject rights and uh, 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 legitimate research interests and um, to indicate what we're doing to commit uh, to a code of conduct can help us uh, to show uh, and uh, renew the trust uh, by the public in our doings. Now, what happened uh, so far with the Code of Conduct initiatives? Uh, let me present you some uh, key activities that we endeavored uh, basically since early February 2017. Um, after BBMRI figured out, well, um, we are not the ones who go on this road uh, to this, on this adventure alone. Uh, we started with a, a seminar to present the idea to stakeholders for the first time. Uh, this initiative was then uh, repeated later in June in year with, uh, with a more uh, precise uh, idea of where we want to go and to help together with stakeholders identifying the topics. Um, no surprise, the key topics uh, were then and remained uh, pseudonymization and consent. And um, to start uh, a more uh, clearer uh, process in how uh, the drafting of such a code can come together. I will later on uh, come again uh, back to the drafting group and how it came about. Uh, but the first um, idea of a code of conduct was obviously as well not to reinvent the wheel anew, but to build on already uh, existing codes that are out there that are both project specific and obviously as the GDPR was not in force, was not validated um, by uh, the um, uh, European Commission. However, uh, the IMI code of practice and the RD Connect uh, uh, code were uh, quite important milestones, I find, in our community 
because uh, they are uh, publicly accessible and a lot of uh, other consortia and organizations have uh, taken it either as a reference uh, document or voluntarily started to adhere um, as best as they could uh, to these codes. Now, um, building on these two codes, um, we agreed in even simplifying the language and um, commented in full detail, uh, especially on the IMI code of practice, um, focusing on um, pseudonymization and uh, consent again, uh, as well as legal basis, so to update it to the requirements of uh, the GDPR. We uh, continued with, with various meetings and the discussions were um, not um, as easy as we thought because even though we agreed on the health sector and quite naturally so, uh, we figured out only in the discussions that the devil always lies in the details and what is important for the biobanking field uh, might be less important or even more important for the clinical trials. Um, patient organizations uh, have another focus and uh, to bring the different viewpoints uh, together, uh, this is challenging. Um, a key breakthrough happened uh, in our anonymization and pseudonymization workshop, and uh, this cannot be repeated often enough. Uh, the GDPR uh, concerns only uh, pseudonymized data and does not concern, well, or more clearly even, does not concern uh, anonymized um, data. However, to understand what the GDPR does not, is not concerned with, you still have to define uh, what you mean by anonymization. And um, a common misunderstanding is still today that uh, if the data is anonymized for somebody else. So the data is coded, de-identified or pseudonymized, but shared with somebody else for whom it is anonymized, that then uh, the person, the researcher, the organization who receives uh, the for him, her uh, anonymized data is not concerned with the GDPR. Uh, this is absolutely wrong. Whenever there is um, the key somewhere and data can uh, be re-identified by somebody, it, is, uh, it falls under the jurisdiction of uh, the GDPR. How to make this practically understandable and how to develop the code is one of the, uh, our key um, challenges. Um, we took a lot of effort also in the meetings in discussing um, with uh, policymakers uh, as well as uh, the EDPS uh, DG representatives from DG Justice, uh, National Data Protection Authorities, um, to get a feel uh, in which direction uh, the, the implementation is going nationally. What do we have to take into account? Because Although the Code of Conduct uh, for Health Research um, has a European scope and uh, will uh, contribute uh, um, to uh, a good extent in creating clarity, that is our aim. Um, it is so that the national implementations, as uh, you well know, is um, still uh, ongoing in some countries and is definitely a challenge in what the fine tunings are. To uh, take uh, an example from this, from consent in the UK um, uh, or, or some other countries as well, uh, informed consent is uh, for, for them very often not uh, a or not the exclusive legal basis for which you can uh, used for data transfer uh, in health research, whereas in other countries it is the predominant one. And when you think of a transnational, only even within Europe, transnational data exchange, um, I assume that a lot of uh, people who listen in today, this is already a challenge and uh, involves uh, legal departments, ethics committees, and uh, in the future more and more uh, data protection authorities, um, a longer process. Um, it will uh, continue to some extent. 
to be so. Now, where are we in terms of our uh, state of work with the code of conduct today and where is our current focus? Um, here, um, on four main items, uh, the lawfulness of processing. Um, is there, what is the reason why you are uh, allowed to process uh, data for the purpose that you have? It can be uh, a law, it can be a specific consent. Um, all this is uh, uh, for us, health research, um, laid out in especially Article 9J and then linked to 6 and 89. Second, the responsibility um, of uh, the data controller and processor and, very important, uh, their relationship. Here, um, we have a lot of uh, good insight and discussions with our colleagues from clinical trials that have uh, a good experience so far with the establishment of uh, joint controllerships. And uh, in theory, joint controllership is easily uh, set up. However, in practice, it can be uh, very challenging uh, if you have more than three joint controllers um, then the responsibilities differ and to follow up uh, many diverse responsibilities can indeed be a, a challenge of its own. And uh, the recommendation probably will be uh, to do a vast joint controllership only if absolutely necessary and to present in the code uh, good models uh, that have already uh, a good experience in practice when they are working and uh, also examples or recommendations um, statements why we are suggesting don't go towards that route uh, that might uh, run you into some challenges. Now, in this regard, um, one cannot repeat often enough that the burden of proof is always with the uh, controller and uh, here it is important um, to recall one of the key principles of the GDPR as well, that is accountability. Um, the fear uh, from many uh, organizations and researchers is that uh, there is a vast bureaucratic burden. And here the code also aims to contribute in limiting it to what is necessary to be accountable um, for the actions and that the burden of proof becomes something that is uh, less of a burden. The next item uh, is uh, the appropriate safeguards, uh, especially pseudonymization uh, is here key. Um, it also links to some extent uh, with security measurements and uh, the safeguards. Um, it is always important to note that uh, the key uh, is always linked also to appropriate so when you consider safeguards for, for your endeavor, they have to be appropriate for what you're doing, what your funding situation is, uh, in which field you're operating, and what the actual risks are, and not the worst case scenarios that uh, you can imagine. And uh, I speak here for myself, but I guess uh, it is true for most of our listeners. Uh, we as researchers have a vast, and beautiful imagination um, and can uh, go in competition with uh, the Marvel series. Um, um, important here to note uh, again uh, is anonymization um, versus personal data. When personal data, or when data is identifiable, it constitutes the GDPR. When it's anonymized, well, we are um, off the hook. I mentioned earlier uh, to talk a bit more about uh, the drafting group. When I talk about the drafting group, I talk, um, I put it into the context with our stakeholders and I talk about the level of involvement that we uh, currently have. The drafting group uh, consists uh, of some members, uh, they are mentioned uh, later on by name, uh, that represent organizations and sectors um, industry, patient advocacy, research, and uh, biomedical science research infrastructures. Um, the drafting group uh, kind of uh, came naturally together uh, with uh, 
individuals that work in these organizations and sectors that have contributed to the RD Connect um, and IMI code of practice and have uh, renowned expertise uh, in the field to uh, come up with such a code. Um, the drafting uh, is still ongoing. Um, we have developed the uh, various sections and are now pulling it together. We uh, will invite uh, for comments uh, with so-called reference groups uh, that will be defined with uh, the topics at hand, like anonymization, uh, like consent, uh, to come up ultimately with a code uh, that is then um, ready for public consultation. For now, we are expecting uh, this round uh, of public consultation to start the earliest uh, in autumn this year. And we have uh, the group together, which we call the forum, that encompasses uh, the stakeholders or all individuals and organizations that are interested in the code's development and uh, to whom we will uh, send out any uh, draft um, as soon as it is available. Whenever we have uh, good uh, news, uh, we are communicating this um, via our mailing lists and our code of conduct website. Now, thinking of the structure of the codes, we thought of key questions um, in the style of frequently asked questions that build on uh, the issues that arise in the workflow for a researcher and data controller um, that should allow in a non-legalistic language uh, to easily assess what is important for me. And the starting question obviously has to be, am I handling personal and sensitive data? If it is no, well, there is no need then to uh, continue reading a code of conduct uh, for health research. We assume it, it is yes, then you can continue. What am I doing with the data exactly? What is then my role? What are my duties? What are my legal bases? And here uh, we present uh, various scenarios from uh, clinical trials um, and uh, health research um, by bank research. How do I anonymize and pseudonymize data? Um, here we will present the principle. We will also uh, present um, suggestions uh, how to find that are to be found in the annex of uh, what are good techniques, but we're not, will definitely not uh, promote uh, pseudonymization or anonymization tools. We can only say this is, these are the principles that help you to identify um, for your research project, for your organization, how to do it with uh, good common sense and under the legal requirements. <clears throat> what are the information obligations would relate to uh, issues like what do I have to tell the data subject concerned uh, about my ongoing research, how am I going to do this, and to link it in a next step um, to best practices. What am I saying in particular? The code of conduct uh, presents in the meta level how to handle um, in regard to the GDPR uh, data, whereas um, best practices point out in a specific field uh, that already works and what, what would be a re good recommendation and is more on the practical side. What do I have to do to enable research participants to exercise their rights? What do I have to do in order to protect the privacy uh, of the research participants? How long can I retain the data? Uh, can I reuse the data? Who owns the data? Uh, with whom can I share my data? And uh, always linked, what about uh, data security? So again, um, our code of conduct for health research will use non-legalistic language as much as possible. Um, here, uh, the rules are also quite clear that any code should not just um, reference or copy base what is anyways already readable in the GDPR. It builds on FAQ style 
uh, on an FAQ style and starts with a question and as a subheading, uh, a rule recommendation in a specific area, the explanation why we came up with this rule uh, and uh, an example and very often examples to make the differentiation, whether it's clinical trials uh, or um, regular research. We will also work uh, a lot with um, graphs to make easily understandable uh, what the issues are. And uh, just for the sake of argument, I present here um, a, a graph on data minimization, pseudonymization, anonymization that should allow to uh, easily assess whether it consists uh, anonymized data and to help with uh, residual risk evaluation. Again, the risk evaluation should be based on uh, actual risks that might occur. Um, here we are also collecting uh, currently uh, some examples. We, that is the, the drafting group, uh, on uh, what, what other colleagues have done, which actual uh, incidents happened in the context of a research project and not um, the worst case scenario that we can imagine. Now, uh, an example of uh, the code in writing, uh, I mentioned uh, the, 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 the heading in terms of anonymization, it would give uh, an explanation what anonymization is about. Um, it would give uh, an example, uh, in this case, the name Harry Smith is not sufficient to identify someone globally, but uh, it is enough to know who uh, he, you should read here, uh, he is in the classroom. Properly anonymized data, according to the state uh, of the art of 20 years ago, might be easily re-identified with the technology or additional information, for example, in the social media available today. So again, what constitutes anonymization is definitely also context dependent, um, has to be reassessed regularly, also because uh, technology or especially because technology is advancing. In writing here, therefore you must check if your research data is personal data in the context and at the time of your intended research project, it is especially important if you are going to reuse data that uh, uh, has been collected for a previous research project or any other purpose. So our rule is the status of the research data as personal data or anonymous data must be ensured for each use of uh, sharing for research. Of course, a critical question then for you might be to identify uh, or to clarify what then each use uh, for sharing data for research means. What about uh, the governance? Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we had uh, talks with uh, the policymakers uh, in Brussels and they pointed out uh, something very, very clearly, that is, uh, if we are aiming for uh, um, code of conduct along Article 40, then the content of the code is equally important as its governance, um, which also concludes in terms of who uh, is able to certify, who is monitoring approved uh, codes of conduct. This is uh, specified, by the way, in Article 41. We have um, been talking here um, to the um, uh, policymakers in Brussels and have learned that uh, the um, procedure how to submit uh, the code uh, is well obviously specified in uh, the GDPR. However, the full detail is not clear and uh, the um, European Commission uh, has received more interest in codes of conduct by various groups, not only health, not health research, but uh, uh, from companies and from, um, from uh, all the sectors that are concerned with uh, data protection, and uh, is uh, setting up a more detailed procedure. 
uh, when uh, that would then specify, for instance, in which um, national DPA uh, could I uh, turn in the code of conduct to be more precise. Um, or more poignant, it could be that uh, there is uh, uh, everybody sets up uh, an institution, an organization in Ireland that all codes of conduct are therefore submitted in, in Ireland that would uh, basically um, swamp uh, the uh, National Data Protection Authority there and uh, would uh, be counterproductive to the whole process in creating clarity. Also, uh, it could uh, lead to um, an unequal distribution uh, of workload because, again, the code of conduct uh, that is turned in under Article 40 has to be uh, of European value. Now, the Working Party 29, that is uh, the group uh, representing all data protection authorities, started uh, to uh, draft or to work on a more detailed procedure and how to do that, including the response time that they have for commenting on the code, uh, that you will then have uh, to revise the code, uh, and so on. And this work is now continued by uh, the European Data Protection Board. For uh, this particular initiative, um, we have uh, just started of considering uh, the governance structure. We are uh, pursuing several ideas and um, I can already announce that we can give a further update uh, in autumn uh, about this. However, we also follow the advice in getting the content uh, co correct first before then turning to the um, governance in full detail. What are the next steps? Um, since uh, you have not seen a consolidated draft for comments, this is still ongoing work. Um, the uh, checkup with uh, experts uh, has already uh, started and uh, the consolidating of uh, draft sections and then uh, releasing it to a broader audience can be expected earliest um, in autumn uh, 2018. The aim is uh, to be ready for uh, submission to the European uh, Commission via a national DPA. So when you turn it in on a national level, uh, the National Data Protection Authority, uh, say we do it in France, then it will be the CNIL, uh, looks at the code and if it sees that it is sector specific, that it uh, um, that concerns uh, Europe as a whole, um, and uh, Europe indeed, and the governance structure is indeed in place, then it will be discussed on a, on a European level, because obviously, uh, if it is of European concern, then it does not make uh, sense that the national DPA um, decides upon it. The aim is also uh, to finalize by the end of the year, but given uh, that the national implementations of the GDPR are delayed, given that um, 17 out of 24 uh, national data protection authorities uh, just a week before the GDPR entered into force said, well, we are not ready either, we are, and we are basically understaffed, it will take longer. So the status update for uh, the Code of Conduct initiative is definitely uh, an adventure, and it is uh, the presentation of a long road but uh, the way forward. In this regard, it is important to mention what the code is and what the code isn't. The code is definitely not the holy grail. The only holy grail that I personally believe in is uh, the one from the Monty Pythons and should only be enjoyed in a very careful doses with uh, alone or with friends by watching the movie. Um, but what the code is, is on a meta level uh, a guidance document, an adherence that creates 
bit more clarity that can help uh, you locally within your research project, within your organizations um, to go in one direction and to contribute uh, to a good balance in the community uh, to go in certain directions, especially in areas where the GDPR is not as clear as we would like to be, or to bring forward solutions when one country has, uh, say, a biobank law and the others not, and still you want within uh, Europe uh, data exchange uh, possible and simplify uh, the mutual transfer um, uh, and data agreements. So what I'm also saying is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the code of conduct is definitely linked to the GDPR. Do not wait, obviously, for uh, the code of conduct to appear and miraculously save all your lives, but adhere uh, na locally within your research project, your organization, um, as good as you can to the GDPR, understand it as spring cleaning. I'm certain that even before uh, it came into being, a lot of procedures had been already in place and others uh, were in place but uh, were outdated. Well, that, that is the chance. Um, also for your own health uh, and to stay sane, uh, this is one way to understand the GDPR. Uh, obviously, um, check your procedures in terms of uh, quality management, data security, human resources, communication, legal basis and consent procedures. And uh, train your staff, uh, train yourself. Uh, don't keep your password on a sticky note on your computer screen. Uh, all this before uh, we even talk uh, of a code of conduct. But um, think of a code of conduct in how you uh, treat your data. <clears throat> then I'm, <clears throat> I'm introducing another element that is important for our code of conduct for health research that will be <clears throat> research integrity. If you're interested and if you have not done so, sign up to our newsletter. Uh, and uh, get the updates on our code of conduct for health research um, website. And um, with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm available for uh, soon for your questions. Concluding with uh, pointing out uh, the colleagues of the drafting group, Arrange Linda, Rosina Molnar Garbor, Deborah Moskalsoni, Michela Matai, um, Anastasia Nikruk, Evert Ben van Veen, Alistair Kent, David Downson, Anne Barr, Minerva de la Paz, and Christian Becker. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. So we'll go to questions. Um, if you can write your questions in the GoToWebinar question panel, and then we'll go through them. While you write them, I'll start with the first question. Um, how can an organization get involved in the initiative? So we've heard that an individual can sign up to the newsletter. Is that the same as an organization? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, for the moment, we're not um, dividing between individuals and organizations. Uh, anyone who is interested, uh, please sign up uh, for the newsletter. Do also not hesitate uh, to contact me directly. Uh, although I might have a lower response rate than, than usual. Um, but when it comes uh, to the public consultation, when the code of conduct will be ready, um, we uh, assume that it uh, will generate a lot of interest and we favor and definitely organizations or working group feedbacks that can say, well, we are representing, um, say, the research infrastructure X and Y, or we are representing rare diseases, uh, and we um, we have these comments to the current code. Here you're going in absolutely in the right direction, but there you have missed something out. And uh, this makes the uh, co consultation uh, process for us easier but uh, as well for anyone um, outside in the sense that you know if your community 
sees the code uh, as something beneficial and is accepted uh, by a community or uh, a research group, but also um, it is easier to take then uh, the comments uh, into account because we can say uh, from these stakeholders, uh, these comments were in. Because what the drafting group uh, is and is not, it is a group of experts, of course, but uh, they uh, ultimately will also uh, draw the pen in the direction what is needed and desired from the community. Okay, thank you. We've got a number of questions from the attendees. Um, the first one, um, in your opinion, do you need a basis in national law for data processing for scientific purposes on the basis of Article 9J or a sufficient basis for GDPR? I think it makes uh, life much easier if there is a legal basis in the law. Uh, I think of uh, a biobank law uh, that there is. Um, but, um, and most of us in research have it because there's also um, uh, various health laws in the clinic and so on, um, where you anyways have to do data processing, but uh, it is not an absolute must. Uh, it can also be consent. Um, we have a number of questions uh, around broad consent. Um, now the article 29, working group has recently produced a document with a very narrow interpretation of broad consent which is certainly counterproductive for clinical research will the code of conduct clarify this point um, this is our aim this is definitely our aim um, we have not been happy about the um, guidelines from the working party 29 on consent uh, either we uh, also see that it created uh, more confusion than clarity, especially when it comes to research. Um, one way forward, uh, definitely for us, uh, is that in the code of conduct, we have to uh, address it. Um, the how, please give us time here when, when you see the draft, uh, because that is, um, I think too premature to, to really discuss, or I would be not the right person here. But um, what we uh, definitely see as well is, again, the GDPR was drafted uh, against the Googles and the Facebooks in this world, and research was just seen, well, there will be an exemption in the end, and that's it. And with the guidelines, we see uh, that the uh, practices and issues and concerns uh, of researchers, also what is already in place, um, is not well known uh, to those who have drafted these guidelines. And despite the fact that many uh, organizations have uh, commented on it, uh, we clearly have not done it good enough because it was not taken um, into account. So in a nutshell, uh, I think that the guidelines created uh, for research that is uh, more confusion than clarity. And yes, we have to tackle it in the code. OK, we have another question um, here. Do you happen to have an insight or feeling about any impetus to translate the code into a legal framework across the EU? Not the code. It uh, well, when it comes to uh, legal adherence and in terms of uh, certification, um, that because if it is certified um, by uh, the European Commission or by the supervisory authority, then uh, it uh, is uh, a document that can help to create more clarity. When it comes to an actual law and in terms of harmonization, that is, uh, I don't see that around the corner. Uh, also, uh, if we take the broader political perspective, that nationalism uh, is very fashionable, to put it mildly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then the next question, will you integrate the other code of conduct or practices you mentioned at the beginning, or will you involve the people who worked in these? As an example, as given RD Connect, and also thinking about IMI eTrix project code of practice on secondary mm -hmm. use of medical data in scientific research projects. 
Mm -hmm. um, yes, we yes we are. We have uh, three representatives uh, that were also involved in uh, drafting these codes. That is uh, Deborah Moscasoni for the RD Connect code and Anbar and Irene Schlinder uh, who were involved from the IMI code of practice. There's the next question. You touched briefly on the monitoring of the code as outlined in GDPR Article 41. How did you implement the monitoring system in the editing process so far? And how will the code scrutinize its members in the future? For instance, will BBMRI, um, as the competent monitoring body, oversee the adherences? Mm. Uh, the open question for us is who is going to be uh, the monitoring body is uh, still under discussion. It clearly has to be uh, a body that is accepted not only by uh, the supervisory authorities but also uh, by the community uh, and definitely has uh, the expertise. So one uh, discussion uh, our, our group just had the other day was uh, to think of setting up a, a society for this because the critical point is in terms of uh, monitoring uh, the adherence is uh, not only uh, who is competent but also who has the resources to do so and uh, here we still have to find ways um, we are also uh, looking uh, towards the uh, now european data protection board uh, and, and their knowledge in terms of the process, because for health research and the complexities, it was not particularly clear for us how this can be done. Um, I hope to have here more detailed news um, after the summer. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to conclude the questions here. I would like to thank Michaela very much and um, everyone for attending. Now, before we finish, I would just like to announce our next webinar, which is on the 10th of July. And the title is BBMRI Eric LC Help Desk, Personalizing LC Support. It will be at the same time and it'll be Yasuta Grebel from BBMRI Eric presenting this webinar.